lightning has broken like the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from Good morning. We'll wait a couple of more minutes. I'm sure some more people will be stopping by this morning. Um, but are there any uh, announcements for Palm Sunday um, that need to be brought or repeated or? I have one. There are some more annual reports available on the table out in the narthex. If you hadn't gotten one via email or a paper copy already, there's there are some out there. I would like to announce for those who may not uh, have read it anywhere else that um, Bud Ross, who passed away this week, his funeral will be here uh, on Wednesday uh, at 11 o'clock. And if you come, uh, we still have to wear masks and uh, practice social distancing. Um, and you're doing it? And Pastor Bill Dufay will be officiating at Bud's funeral. Um, I'd uh, like to welcome everyone who's here today and everyone who's here at home um, to our Palm Sunday uh, celebration. It's a little different uh, this year, but at least we're here this year. So if there are no other announcements. The first hymn though is this. That's right. Uh, the first hymn uh, in your, uh, printed in your bulletin we're not going to use that piece of paper this morning. However, in the red hymnals, we will be singing from uh, page three, uh, number 300 uh, in the red hymnals.
for our joys and concerns this morning. A little bit of an explanation here. Um, I finally got my new glasses, and in celebration thereof, I left my hearing aid home. Uh, so, as you voice those um, joys and concerns now, uh, I urge you to either yell them out or just yell them out as we provide time for them during our prayer this morning, because I will not be able to hear you, most likely. There are also a couple of other things that are going to happen this morning. Uh, you'll notice a little change that I don't think we're going to have a children's message this morning. Instead, we're going to have some... Yes? Okay, we are going to have a children's message. Just learned that. Uh, it's always good to get uh, some input from the back. But um, anyway, and I was left a note here. Uh, I got it, okay. See, when they're written, I can remember them. Okay, we do want to hold uh, Elizabeth Johnson in uh, our prayers this morning, and uh, uh, cer certainly the family of, um, of uh, Bud Ross. And it's passing. Also, I'd like to mention uh, the, the staff passing of David Woodcock. I think he was named the brother of yeah. David Woodcock, was a teacher and a sports coach and grandee for many years. And he just passed away a few days ago. So, prayers for the family of David Woodcock. Good morning. I didn't know if this worked. Um, I have a joy. I'm joyful that Pastor Bill Wright is starting his new ministry in his new church. I think his first official day as their pastor is today, and that's the Feder First Congregational Church in Hadley. So I want to include him in our prayer and pray for him and his new um, church as they go forward in this journey together. Yes, Marine. you guys an update about the Dino Fest. I am waiting, uh, as it stands right now, today, this moment, they said, uh, the Board of Health said no to the Dino Fest. However, they did say, try again next month because everything is going to change. As far as I know, we're in phase four now, uh, the state reopening, so it's pretty much, we're, we're in good shape. But at the time that I called, they said no because of the way that things are. Uh, I will be sending out an email to all the uh, board chairs for, uh, for a follow-up of the email that I sent last month. Uh, I think you guys all know about that. And I'm glad to see the place is open. Peace, bro. Are there any other concerns at this point? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that 
Although normally we would have an Easter egg hunt next week, uh, we won't be able to do that. So I just wanted to say a thank you to the youth group who have donated some special bags and Easter treats. So for any kids that are able to do a, a distance drop off or pick up, those will be available for you next Sunday and we wish you all well. Okay, there seem to be no further um, joys and concerns at this time. Uh, let us move forward then and be together in prayer. Ever gracious God, on this Sunday when we do not know whether to celebrate our Lord's entry into Jerusalem or commiserate his upcoming crucifixion, we are vividly reminded of life's eternal ambiguity. Help us in these troubled days to find strength and solace in all of life and give us a vision that moves us beyond the troubles of today toward the sure and certain hope of peace and joy in all our tomorrows. On this day, mighty one, we see your signs of promise all about us, especially in these early days of spring. Even as we see blossoms popping up in unexpected places, help us to notice all your signs of goodness about us, especially in those people where we have too long dismissed any possibility of it. Expand our ability to love without limitation and to reaffirm daily that though we know we are loved beyond belief, so too those whom we would dismiss or marginalize share your limitless love as well. Move us away from self-serving thoughts and actions and show us again how we might serve one another. In these times, gracious God, when we are bombarded each day by more and more bad news demonstrating humanity's penchant for inhumanity, help us to find ways to reach those who would take out their frustrations and misguided ideals with brutality and weaponry and show them that violence in any form is not God's way. May we find ways to move from the temptations toward evil toward the promise of everlasting peace and love. May this quest take concrete form in and through us and in our secular society. Today we would lift up the many concerns that would overwhelm us should we not recognize and receive your daily strengthening hand in everything that we do. We pray, O oh God, for all the victims of gun violence for all those suffering from acts of unbridled racism, for those falling victim to the pain and violence of disease, and for those who minister to them in homes and in places of treatment and healing. We pray also for those whose lives cannot attain the fullness you ordain for all of your children, especially those who are disabled in body or mind. Bring your healing hand to take our bleeding hands, your healing hand to take our bleeding hands. Fill us with all your strength and love that we might praise your name at all times, in all places, and in all circumstances. And move us, mighty one, through this Passion Week so that we might know the glory of your Easter message when we return to this place one week hence. And now be with us as we were joined together to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now as we remain standing, it's a good time for us to wave those palms and greet each other. And as we begin to do so, I want to share with you um, a poem. It's actually a hymn. It's in the Chalice Hymnal. And I'd like to read the first three verses of that. Kind of, kind of sets the stage for this Palm Sunday. A cheering, chanting, dizzy crowd hath stripped the green trees bare, and hailing Christ as king aloud, waved branches in the air. They laid their garments in the road and spread his path with palms, and vows of lasting love bestowed with royal hymns and psalms. When day dimmed down to deepening dark, the crowd began to fade, till only trampled leaves and bark were left from the parade. Peace. <laughs> Peace. 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 and welcome to our children's message. This morning, we're going to be telling the story of Palm Sunday, and we have some participants with us to help us share that story. As Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he asked two of his disciples to go ahead of him. He said, when you get to the town, you will see a donkey tied up. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks you about taking the donkey, just tell them, the Lord needs it, and he will bring it back as soon as he is done with it. So the disciples did as Jesus asked. They soon found the donkey tied at a doorway. As they were untying it, some people were standing nearby visiting. They didn't recognize the men, and they asked, what are you doing? Why are you untying the donkey? They replied just as Jesus had told them to explaining that the Lord needed it, and the people let them go. When the donkey was brought to Jesus, some of the disciples took off their coats and laid them on the donkey's back. They did this out of respect for Jesus. Then the Jesus rode the donkey towards Jerusalem. As he was trapped, As he was traveling, some people saw Jesus coming 
and came running towards him. They heard that he might be coming, and they wanted to see him because he had just helped a dead man come back to life. One by one, they laid their coats on the ground for the donkey to step on. Even the people that weren't wearing coats ran to the fields and trees nearby and cut palm branches and laid them down. These people knew that Jesus was special. It was like when a king or queen would come to town and people would roll out a red carpet for him to step on. This is what these people did for Jesus when they laid down their coats and branches. As they got even closer to town and more people noticed Jesus, a crowd surrounded him and started to shout praises. Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. The word Hosanna means save us. They said this because Jesus was helping them and doing amazing things. They wanted to praise him and they wanted him to keep praising them. Some men named Pharisees, these men were important because they taught people a lot who listened to them. They heard the crowd praising God. They said, Jesus, teacher, why don't you tell these people to stop praising as if you were God? The Pharisees thought Jesus was getting too much attention from the people. They wanted to be the most important, but everyone was listening to Jesus instead. Jesus replied, if they were quiet now, even the rocks would cry out. Even the rocks knew that he was God after all. Jesus did make them. Now Jesus could see Jerusalem, and it made him very sad. He came to help people, but no one realized he was God and they would not accept him. So we do have a lesson out in the narthex for anybody who would like to take one with them today. And for those who don't, we do have them available for a distance pickup or drop off. You just need to let us know if you'd like a copy. Thank you. Good morning again. This morning's first scripture lesson comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our gospel lesson from Mark will echo the uh, children's message today. This is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 <coughs> through 11. Mark 11, 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, and others spread leafy, leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12 disciples. May God grant understanding and inspiration to these readings from his word. Amen. If you read the title of my sermon, you're probably wondering why you came to worship this morning. After all, do we go to church to be confounded by more questions, or do we come to find answers to questions that we fail to resolve on our own? And though we know that ultimately we will come to know the answers only when we pass on, we know that penultimately we will never dodge the flood of questions that are essential to our humanity. Certainly the last half dozen or so years have been incredibly challenging to our psyche, individually and as a society. Trying to separate fact from fiction, wondering who to believe, trying to solve all the special circumstances caused by the pandemic, testing the depth of our relationships, calling into questions long-held beliefs, pushing the limits of our own creativity, saying goodbye in new ways, and finding ways to mark passings without having a chance to say goodbye. These deeper issues often go unrecognized while we try to grapple with the ones we cannot ignore. The violence of so many mass shootings, the way the governing of politics has overcome the politics of government. Should I take the vaccine and which one is best? How must we adapt our home lives to accommodate young people who must now study remotely? When can we travel and how can we travel? Do we even want to travel? Or as one person remarked, when can we stop just washing our hands and take a shower? For our family, when things get really tense, it's humor that gets us through. And I know that Jesus knew that as well but that's a sermon for another time. During this pandemic, we have not seen our two older daughters and their families since a year ago Christmas, and that hurts a lot. We have, however, somehow eased that by a monthly Zoom meeting. But a week ago today, during our regular 3 p.m. third Sunday of the month Zoom meeting, which was not going well technologically speaking, a blurb appeared on our computer screen that read, your interconnection is unstable. And that blurb was the perfect opening for this sermon. After all, in these days, all of life seems unstable, doesn't it? We have lost dear friends, and we couldn't join with the family for a funeral service. We've lost a family member and a very close friend because we dared to offer an opinion or share a life experience that didn't fit into their simplistic belief systems. And perhaps one more example will serve to focus this sermon. We have all, well, almost all, been appalled at the recent rash of hate crimes against Asian Americans. And except for the especially dense folk, we know that the origin of that is the belief that COVID-19 is of Chinese origin. But if we dare to go a bit deeper, then how come there were no hate crimes against Spanish folk during the outbreak of the Spanish flu in 1918, which took my grandfather's life? And the answer to that enigma is found not in the events themselves, but in the unanswered questions of humanity's pervasive inhumanity. Now, Palm Sunday fits right into our current mindset. Even the compilers of the Common Lectionary offer not one but two sets of scripture reading for this week before Easter. Depending on the tradition of the congregation and the preacher of the day, one can either celebrate this week as Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday. 
There are lots of questions that beg to be answered about Palm Sunday. Had Jesus made a reservation for his transportation needs? Specifically, did he ask that a donkey be made available when he finally got to Jerusalem? Or was it just by chance or divine plan that it was so? If Jesus was seen as the Messiah, why didn't he ride on a horse, which would have been far more fitting? What were the crowds really saying when Jesus rode into the city he loved so much? There is even a translation problem of the word Hosanna. There is also the question as to whether there were some folk in that crowd who were already yelling, crucify him, crucify him. After all, Good Friday was less than a week away. And then there is that nagging question for both the gospel writers and contemporary thinkers as to how Palm Sunday can be understood in such a positive way when Jesus was in fact entering Jerusalem to face his own death. And another question, perhaps quite trivial, concerns the palm branches. Why are palm branches mentioned when they are not a part of the Palestinian landscape? There are so many questions, in fact, that one is tempted to ask whether or not there is any truth in the Palm Sunday account. Well, rest assured, dear sisters and brothers, not only is the account true, but there is more truth in it than meets our 21st century ease, eyes and ears. Let's take it from the top. Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem is portrayed by artist and storyteller in the most picturesque of terms. Think of it, a beautiful, balmy spring day in the Middle East. Birds singing, children laughing, upbeat people smiling and laughing. Then the crowds moving as one to get closer to this Jesus who they heard so much about. There he comes, riding on a donkey that had never before carried a human being. He looks somewhat serene despite a certain seriousness that betrays the facade. Greeted by shouts of acclamation and cries of Hosanna, Jesus acknowledges the crowd in his usual humble manner. And then, followed by disciples and admirers, his little animal carries its sacred burden into the very city Jesus loved so much, carries him over a carpet of branches hastily laid out for society's hero of the past, and hope for the future. What a beautiful picture indeed. It is this very image that has provided the setting the church emphasizes year after year after year. It's a unique celebration, a parade, and we celebrate the day keeping all of the foregoing firmly in mind, and it's good that we do. Palm Sunday stands by itself as a testimonial to all that is pure and good and holy. But there is this uncomfortable undercurrent. The branches are not quite as healthy as they seemed, now seeing them close up. And not to dismiss the palm branches too soon, I said before that palms were not native to Palestine, and if they had been imported, it would have been for the Feast of Tabernacles, which was always held in the fall. So either the branches were not palms at all, or our notion of Palm Sunday being a spring event is suspect. Then too, there is a question as to the geographical situation according to Mark's gospel. Either Jesus took a very circuitous route to get to Jerusalem, or else Mark's account, either geographically or chronologically, is wanting. We also have to raise the question as to why Jesus selected a donkey rather than a horse when a horse would have been far more appropriate for the Messiah of Jewish expectation. Questions, questions, questions. Perhaps if you and I had been observing the Palm Sunday spectacle, wouldn't it have seemed a bit odd to us, fairly bright individuals that we are? Maybe if Jesus had come into the city riding on a horse, followed by a well-decked out entourage, the picture of women and men placing palms on his path would have seemed far more likely. But to see them doing that in the real face of one man riding on a donkey 
with a dozen very common men following behind doesn't capture our imagination. Now, I don't know about you, but what the crowds were saying in greeting Jesus seems more than a little bit strange. We know the translated biblical word pretty well. Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And from our modern perspective, those words are wonderful and theologically right on target. But they were not so for Jesus' contemporaries. The literal translation of Hosanna is not God saves, it's not praise God, but rather please help. And that's only half of the language problem. It's a minor part. It's really not that important as to what Jesus' supporters said. What is important is what other people were saying. With Good Friday only five days away, is it not logical to assume that there were some troublemakers in that crowd? Were all those cries of Hosanna true? Or were some of them crucify him? Or gestures of ridicule and rejection? If Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week, which it most certainly does, we cannot allow this day to stand on its own, detached from reality and facts so much in evidence. So from the matter of questions and the puzzle of the branches, let us look for the root of the problem. There is no doubt that the Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday wore a serious countenance. He was not smiling and in all likelihood wasn't terribly aware of the reactions of the crowd. His mind was elsewhere, on Calvary, and what would happen before the week was out. What is so often portrayed as a parade so as to appeal to modern folk was much more like a funeral procession, albeit a bit premature. Jesus could hardly have put on a happy face even if the people were smiling, shouting Hosanna, and offering the blessings of their hearts. Jesus was somewhere else. He knew that even those who pretended to give him their allegiance on that day would soon raise fists in anger and join the rest of the maddening crowd shouting, crucify, crucify him. The language was about to take a turn for the worse, wasn't it? And even among those who on Palm Sunday were genuinely laudatory in their remarks, there was a grave misunderstanding for they were expecting a Davidic Messiah, a political animal who would restore the fortunes of Israel. They didn't want this humble preacher who spoke of a kingdom not of this world, much less a Messiah who didn't measure up to their expectations or illusions. And as soon as they realized their mistake, they didn't find it difficult to jump on the bandwagon with those who sought Jesus' death. Little did it matter that the illusion was the culprit. It was so much easier to project their anger on Jesus than to acknowledge their failure to recognize the truth. Fortunately, what the crowds were saying about Jesus publicly or under their breath didn't determine the course of human history. There's a lesson for us. What we may assert as fact is always subject to divine approval or rejection. And therefore, getting our facts straight is far from a simple matter. If we look for the solution to this Palm Sunday puzzle in the various gospel texts that covered our Lord's entry into Jerusalem, we're headed for disappointment. For the solution to the puzzle lies not in the difficulties of the circumstances, but rather in the essence of the one about whom the whole story revolves. And that truth is found in our first text for today from Paul's letter to the Philippians, which is, incidentally, the oldest known Christian hymn. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And there's one thing I have to qualify right here. The biblical translation that Jeff read for us this morning translates servant as slave. Technically, slave is correct, 
but slave in Jesus' time meant servant, not the slaves that we're familiar with. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's why he rode on the donkey rather than a horse. Servants don't ride horses. If in fact the crowds meant to say, please help when they use the word Hosanna, it fits right in. For Jesus was in the form of God. And Jesus had the power and the authority to send people the help they needed. Now, if in fact the crowds intended their cries to actually mean God saves or praise God, so much the better. Because it would mean that some people recognize Jesus' true identity. The real nature of Palm Sunday, you see, is found not in the crowd's reaction to Jesus' entry into that holy city, but in Jesus' somber and determined attitude, because being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That was his divine destiny, and everything else in his life, including the whole Palm Sunday event, led to that. Too many people misinterpret Palm Sunday, thinking that it's an end to itself, trying to divorce it from the horror of Good Friday, attempting to put a good face on a really bad time. To let Palm Sunday stand on its own is to miss the whole point. Palm Sunday is a signpost, not a hitching post. It points the way toward Calvary, it leads us to Jerusalem, to the upper room, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives, and most certainly to the empty tomb of Easter Sunday. This signpost is a one-way arrow. It is not a stop sign. You see, in confronting the questions of this day, we don't find answers to the trivial. We find the answer to what is eternally true, the identity of the one whom we are pleased to call our Savior. When Jesus entered Jerusalem two millennia ago, he did so in preparation for the Passover and accordingly drew his friends together for the observance and for a special private briefing. In those last days of his earthly journey, Jesus wanted to emphasize that he didn't care whether his disciples understood everything about the mechanics of faith any more than how the church that bears his name would carry on in his absence. Jesus tried to get them to understand what was really important that was his life in them and in us. Today, as 2,000 years ago, he wasn't looking for heads crammed with knowledge, but rather hearts crammed with love. I started this meditation by talking about where we 21st century people find ourselves today particularly in the turmoil in our secular lives. And before I go on, please remember that the sacred and the secular are inseparably woven together. Nothing that goes on in the world around us can be separated from the world within us. As I said, we troubled folk here in 2021 are looking for answers to why so much these days seem to defy all human solutions. There are questions everywhere. Solutions are rare, but still we crave answers to all those questions, and yet, yes, it's important that we do. But sometimes in searching for answers to the trivial, we fail to answer the critical question. Yes, we have to face the reality of rampant violence in our society. We have to address the roots of things like racism, and we have to go behind treating the symptoms to find the causes. We have to recognize that God is not going to miraculously solve all of our questions, but rather work with us to uncover the truths that define who we are and what we can be. And that observation always causes me to recall the words of John the Evangelist in his letter, where he urges us to test the spirits to see whether they are of God. And those words, words that parade as truth, are always self-serving. The word that is truth is God-serving. 
It's tempting, isn't it, to pursue questions because we dare not admit that not everything unknown to us is ours to know, nor is every question that troubles us worthy of trying to solve. We don't have the time to distinguish ultimate truths from passing events. The Palm Sunday narrative is a puzzle by design. We were meant to be confused by it in order to push us to discover for ourselves the real identity of the one who traded down from a horse to a donkey that we might trade up for the certainty of knowing to whom we belong. Yes, indeed, we do need to recognize and deal with the problems that afflict us, our human condition, if you will. We do need to strive for justice, to foster civility and respect, which the Bible calls loving kindness. But most importantly, we need to walk humbly with our God. And that means knowing what we do not know and that that is all right. It means remembering our humanness in every way, our pursuit of knowledge, our capacity to love, our relentless search for answers while recognizing that we must learn to become comfortable with more questions than we will ever find answers to. And finally, my friends, the real nature of Palm Sunday wasn't determined by what the bystanders said or thought as Jesus passed by. The real nature of Palm Sunday is the tragedy of the millions who have allowed Jesus to buy, pass by without a second thought or maybe even a first one. The men and women of this world who refuse to be influenced even by a God. People who refuse to love, much less allow themselves to be loved. I suspect Jesus was unnerved by the Palm Sunday crowd, a bit by those who smiled and hailed him as the Messiah, a bit more perhaps by those who muttered crucify him under their breath. But most of all, Jesus was dismayed and unnerved by those who said nothing. There is a final Lenten challenge before us today, and that is to put ourselves on that first century, in that first century crowd, and honestly ask ourselves what we would have said as Jesus passed by, because that is the one question we must answer. Amen. As most of you know, we don't take an offering in the usual sense of passing a plate around, but we do have a basket out in the narthex uh, where you may place your offering. And in view of those donations that will be made, I offer now this prayer of dedication. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for all the goodness in this place. And we thank you especially that we are able to make an offering to you. Bless this offering that we make today and the offerings we make every day in your name and in your service. That your kingdom may come on earth even as it already is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Now our closing hymn is found on the insert in your bulletin. Ride on, ride on in majesty.
as we move forward now into Holy Week, here again a few words from the psalmist. Lest we be fooled because our hearts have surged with passing praise. Remind us, God, as this week starts where Christ has fixed his gaze. Instead of palms, a winding sheet will have to be unrolled, a carpet much more fit to greet the king a cross to hold. And now, may the God of all peace and love keep you this week. The God we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lead you forth from this place. Amen. Amen.